You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. So you think you had a bad day at work? Try being His Majesty's Royal Distributor of Stamps in Boston, August 1765. When a stuffed effigy appeared with your likeness on it, an unusually large elm tree. Hello, this is Matt from the Explorers Podcast. I want to invite you to join me on the voyages and journeys of the most famous explorers in the history of the world. These are the thrilling and captivating stories of Magellan, Shackleton, Lewis and Clark, and so many other famous and not so famous adventurers from throughout history. Go to explorerspodcast.com or just look us up on your podcast app. That's the Explorers Podcast. There was a likeness of Andrew Oliver whose job as the royal distributor was to be the man that you had to pay to get stamps, to essentially do any meaningful legal paperwork, to be a merchant, or to publish a newspaper in Boston. Not a popular guy. And upon hearing that an effigy of him had appeared on a Boston street, Lieutenant Governor Thomas Hutchinson ordered the sheriff of Boston to take it down. And the sheriff arrived. But the sheriff could do nothing because a large crowd of merchants and mechanics, seven-year war veterans, opposed him. That night, Oliver's effigy was cut down by the crowd and was given a torchlight parade brought to the townhouse, the seat of the legislature, where he was given a virtual funeral. That was not enough for the crowd. They went to the real Oliver's office, tore down the building, putting stamps all over the ruins. Then they went to Oliver's home. There, the effigy was beheaded and burnt. So was Oliver's stable and his coach. The sheriff again was summoned and again was useless. He was stoned and ran away. Oliver's house was entered and then looted. Luckily for him, he was away, but the message was received. The next day, Oliver resigned. He wrote a letter, but that wasn't enough for the mob. The mob that was now running with immunity through Boston, nothing that the law enforcement officials could do. Members of the crowd hussed Oliver through the streets of Boston and then brought him to the very elm tree, and under it he had to verbalize his resignation. Now once he did, they let him off, but this victory was not enough. The mob then set on Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson's home. He wasn't there, but the mob axed, hammered, stoned the house, entered the house and shattered crystal cut open mahogany chairs, tore interior walls down, and dumped out the wine in his cellar. Tens of thousands of dollars in today's terms in property damage. The resistance and fever spread throughout the colonies, not just Boston. In New York, protests against the Stamp Act were just as fierce. The distributive stamps there also resigned. Merchants at the behest of the crowds agreed not to use the stamps despite the Parliament's order. Eventually, the governor of New York's home was also stormed. The Stamp Act could be seen as a genesis of the American Revolution. We always talk about the Tea Party. That was one incident. But the Stamps attacked two groups of people who could be readily organized, merchants and newspaper publishers. It was an impetus to resist His Majesty's officers to turn the rabble into efficient Sons of Liberty organizations, where rough mechanics and wealthy merchants joined. It led to the first early networks of correspondence between the colonies so that they could share information and share tactics that were working. And, eventually, the colonists got Parliament to back down. Another factor besides these stamps that angered Bostonians and early New Yorkers was the presence of troops among them. The battle against the French had brought thousands of troops. And, well, they had to have some place to stay. Some areas had barracks or militia, but this was rarely sufficient in any colony. Generals Braddock and Campbell, who succeeded him, complained to London that colonists weren't helping with their rooming problems. Campbell said, The colonists keep citing rights and privileges and denying his requests. Sometimes the British had to force quarter in people's homes or in public buildings. Parliament 
wasn't happy of learning about this, and in 1765, Parliament passed the Quartering Act. This is nine years before the Declaration of Independence, which dictated that troops had to be quartered at colonists' expense. Why should London pay for the protection of the American frontier? That's how they saw it. Troops would be quartered at inns, alehouses, wine warehouses, makers of methylgen, a kind of spiked honey wine. Or if this was insufficient, they needed to seek private quarters, homes. But at the end of the war we know as the French and Indian War, also the Seven Years' War, colonists wondered why they still had troops among them, why they still had to suffer this cost of taxes, housing space, and booze. Well, New York refused to comply with quartering, and in 1767, Parliament reacted by suspending the New York Assembly until it would vote to quarter troops. In Massachusetts, the legislators also refused to implement the Quartering Act to provide any funds to quarter troops. The governor there put troops up in the State House. Samuel Adams reflected the bitter feelings of many when he said, No man can pretend to say the peace and good order of the community is secure with soldiers quartered in the body of the city as without them. Soldiers are not governed properly by the laws of their country. His craving for separation between military and civilian authority, his suspicion of military troops living among civilians and that they might take advantage, goes way back. Colonist Americans had expected certain rights that went all the way back into English law. The military didn't just appear among English law abiders in peacetime. On either continent, Henry I granted London protection from troops back in the 1100s. Within the city, no one is to be billeted, one of his charters said, neither for one of my household nor for that of any other is lodging to be exacted by force. You can't take the king's house and you can't take one of the king's subjects' house to quarter the army. Then other towns, Oxford, Bedford, Lynn, little Scottish villages, won the same privileges as London got from the king. London's rights on this and many other things, were then codified in the 1215 Magna Carta. So it should not be seen as so strange that as early as 1683, on the American continent, that the New York Charter insisted no troops would be quartered unless in actual war. And so in the Declaration of Independence, we find one of the many offenses that King George had committed, that the Americans were making known to the world for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. That was an anathema to British rights. Thus, after the Revolution, and when a constitutional government was formed, the new Congress decided to take the suggestions of state constitutional conventions and produce amendments which would secure the rights of individuals. James Madison pushed this effort. Now, initially, he didn't think this was necessary. In the Constitutional Convention, which he had participated in greatly, He made no move for a Bill of Rights, but after the convention adjourned and he caught some opposition in his race for a congressional seat, talked a bit with his good friend Thomas Jefferson, he decided that a Bill of Rights, adding a few amendments to the Constitution using the mechanism already there and calling it a Bill of Rights, would help allay some fears and help pass the Constitution. The politics were what motivated him. But he gradually came to actually like the idea on merit as well. He wrote to Jefferson, if nothing else, it will allow men to appeal to the sense of the community if a government would affront the basic rights everyone understands. And so in the first Congress, the House Committee submitted 17 amendments potentially for the Constitution based on the recommendations of these state conventions. But only 12 made it through the Senate and only 10 through the three-fourths of the states needed. Now, this is interesting, but it's not to say that there are seven mystery amendments missing. Many of those 17 originally in the committee were just differently worded versions of what's in the Bill of Rights now. For instance, you had separate amendments about press and religion, which are now combined in the first. There were four discernible different amendments between the House's suggestions and what the Senate approved and what the states approved in the Constitution. We should look at those. For instance, 
an amendment requiring one representative for every 30,000 and regulating the growth of Congress thereafter. Another one was a law forbidding change in Congress's compensation unless an election had passed. Now, this wasn't approved at the time, but later has become the 27th Amendment in the early 1990s, now is law. A third, no state shall infringe on the rights of jury trial or freedom of speech. That didn't make the cut. Would have been mighty interesting because this would have been a limitation on what states can do, which did not end up being any part of the Bill of Rights up until the 14th Amendment was passed. And the fourth, that's discernibly different, that didn't make it, an amendment essentially codifying that the legislature can't take on the duties of the judicial or the executive, the executive can't take on the duties of the legislative or judicial, and the judicial can't take on the duties of the executive or legislature. That didn't pass either enough in the Constitution to separate the branches. It was felt not needed. It is interesting for a moment to think about those four that didn't make it and what how life would have been like. Uh, again, we do have the second one in the 27th Amendment now, and it hasn't really changed the world. But the others might have been interesting, but it didn't happen. Only 10 survived, which perhaps indicates something, that those 10 are important. Of those 10, one hasn't gotten too much attention, and that is the third. It reads, No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, except in the manner prescribed by law. That was 1790. And this amendment sat silently in the Constitution, not bothering anyone, never being bothered. It's been called the Leviticus of the Constitution, a chapter read and no more, to get from one more interesting chapter to another, to get nothing more than a sense of a lost, archaic practice, which doesn't really matter to us moderns. A cute little Third Amendment. Nothing happened with it directly in federal courts until 1979. Only then did the first federal court case involving the third get heard. And the Supreme Court said, well, they didn't speak about it at all. It was just a district court. So maybe it didn't need to. American government mindful that their country had won their independence from Great Britain and those abuses that the Redcoats put us through. No president, no Congress would ever be silly enough to try to force army soldiers to live in private homes without those homes volunteering. And even that one time, 1979, Governor Hugh Carey of New York, he didn't really force army units into people's homes. Well, not exactly. Correction officers in the state went on strike. Of course, they were provided housing while they were correction officers, but now on strike, they were evicted from government housing. One of these was the Mid-Orange Correctional Facility. The governor there had members of the National Guard to regulate the strike and fill in for the prisoner guard duty. Well, they had to live somewhere. So he housed them in the government housing where the correction officers had lived. One of the officers, Marianne Engblom, and a creative lawyer, said her Third Amendment rights had been violated. Soldiers were now quartered in what was her home. The court decision on this was mixed. It did define some of the terms of the Third Amendment, what it might mean in real. Yes, these National Guard troops, for instance, could be considered soldiers. Yes, England's Third Amendment rights had been infringed, certainly. Yes, even government housing is a home, is a house, as the Third Amendment might read, though tenancy of government housing related to work is a little bit less protected than one's bought, purchased home or rented apartment. But in any case, the court said, the emergency of a potential prison riot if there was no one to guard them superseded the Third Amendment violation that might have been there. And no damages could be sought from the soldiers because they're soldiers and they were immune. So that's it. One case doesn't even reach the steps of SCOTUS and can't even meet the threshold for constitutional protection. That's all the handiwork of Madison and the First Congress has received. But there could be a reason for this lack of attention. A third hasn't received press because, well, so clear, so powerful, so tied into American culture, no government would dare. American culture and early English culture would oppose it. William of Orange took uh, power in England, 1688, Protestant king, and forced out James II, Catholic king of England, was awarded the British crown 
to correct what was seen as the abuses of James II. And one of those crimes that justified his taking over was in 1689 that he had raised and kept a standing army in time of peace. That's how the British felt about it. The culture is pretty strong. And putting the 101st in a suburb in Modesto, absent some kind of red dawn, Russians are coming situation, would always have been opposed with hostility. But though the Third has been legally silent for most of history, the Third Amendment has been infringed most likely, and the idea of courting troops has happened. One of these times, it happened as early as the War of 1812, but one of the times these issues were really tested was in the Civil War. In Lyon County, Kentucky, the Saratoga Springs Methodist Church still keeps an odd memento from its past, a bullet hole. Under a small frame reads, a Yankee miniball struck the side of the church, and the hole has been there ever since. Despite putting new siding on the church, the hole has been preserved through the ages. It was the result of when a Union regiment met up with a Confederate cavalry troop in what had been then sort of neutral Kentucky, the beginning of the war in 1861. And it's a reminder of a time when the war reached this border state. Kentucky started the war officially neutral. That's a little bit controversial because President Lincoln refused to accept neutrality from any American state. But he was careful not to have Grant go parading around in Kentucky until the Confederates made the first move. The governor sympathized with the South. The legislature in Kentucky was unionist. But eventually, the state declared loyalty to the Union. That didn't mean everyone, particularly those on the western side of the state, were happy about it. Grant noted, after he captured the previous rebel stronghold of Paducah, Kentucky, men, women, and children came out of their doors, looking pale and frightened at the presence of the invader. They were expecting rebel troops that day. The majority would have preferred the other army. Part of that reason is is because this army was going to seek housing. Armies did as best they could to avoid upsetting civilians, but it was a lower priority than strategic advantage in the Civil War. The Union Army certainly quartered private homes in Virginia. In some cases, rent was paid, a small rent. There were directives coming from Washington, D.C. about what was the appropriate policy, but it wasn't followed in all cases. Some 500,000 in claims would result after the Civil War from the loyal states. The rebel states would put in another 2.5 million in claims. Congress looked at these claims and decided not to pay, because if they did, there would be very millions more. SCOTUS was no help, particularly to the rebel states. In Texas v. White, they declared that on this and many other issues, Texas, Virginia, and other rebel states did not deserve protections. During condition of civil war, their rights were suspended. Quartering has more elements than just housing. Troops can be kept in tents, but they need to be fed. So in Kentucky, The Union Army paid for food, but not without trick. The hog swindle of 1864 turned many a Kentuckian against the Union effort. Stephen Burbridge, Union general in control of Kentucky, asked the farmers of the state to sell hogs directly to the Union Army and where they would pack the meat for the troops rather than going through distributors. It turned out that he had some of his own packers and him and some of his officers may have been on the take. Burbridge promised a fair price, but in the end he paid two cents per pound less for hogs than either the Louisville or Cincinnati markets. And he did something else, which made Kentuckians feel like an oppressed nation. To help enforce, he told his troops not to allow anyone to cross the Kentucky border with a hog. Worse, if they did, they wouldn't just punish them, they would confiscate the swine. Kentucky hog farmers were enraged. This stopped them from using the Cincinnati market, which helped to make the price the Union Army was offering look good. The governor of Kentucky at that time told Lincoln it was causing considerable commotion in the state. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I would like to call redacted history. I believe that all history no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. 
There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I want to take a moment to tell you guys about my podcast called The Team House. My name's Jack Murphy. I'm a former Ranger and Green Beret, and I've worked as a national security journalist for the last 10 years. The Team House is a natural extension of that, where I interview former spies and special operations personnel from all over the world. These are exclusive interviews from people who work in the shadows and come a little bit into the light for these exclusive interviews that we do every week, live streamed on YouTube at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And they're available as video on demand and audio on demand wherever you listen to podcasts. This wasn't a state that Lincoln was popular in despite being born there. Received 1% of the vote in one election, and then in the next, when he had a better chance in 1864, received just 25% of the vote. Part of the reason was the presence of troops, which was unpopular in the state. The third has played a role in peacetime as well, but that role has been as a legal supporting actor. It is an influence in the idea of separation of military and civilian power in the United States. But that's not directly what the amendment says. The third, for instance, was cited in Youngstown Cheating Tube versus Sawyer when President Truman tried to essentially run the steel mill, citing the necessary need of steel for the military. And the court used the third, among other things, to block him to demonstrate that the country knows the difference between wartime and peacetime. Just read the Third Amendment. However, when in Jones versus the United States Secretary of Defense, a group of reservists who did not support the war tried to use the Third to refuse to march in a parade as a violation of the Third Amendment. They were forced to march in a parade, and they didn't want to. A federal court dismissed the suit. In Securities Investor Protection versus Executive Security Corp., a defendant who owed money and cited almost every amendment, including the Third, for not complying with a subpoena to show his assets, he claimed that his house had been bugged and thus violated by soldiers The District Court of New York came as close to laughing at him as is possible in their decision. In 1951, plaintiffs felt that federal rent control would be an incubator of federal bureaucrats being quartered among us in cities where federal rent control existed. And thus, it would be like quartering soldiers. The court didn't agree. So as an actual legal matter, the one federal case and Even that real quartering didn't make the threshold to enforce the Third Amendment rights is all you have. But as a legal thread, a symbol attached to others, the Third has had its most power. Famously, Justice William O. Douglas used it in Griswold v. Connecticut, along with the Fifth and the Fourth, to show that American citizens had a right to privacy, specifically marital privacy. It was not written in the Bill of Rights, but it emanated from the Third the fourth, and others. The third provides an emanation of home as castle. It's not written that we have this home as castle right, but you throw in the ninth, and Douglas argued, you have the key to interpretation. Douglas said, we're supposed to view all the amendments not as limitations on rights, but the people may enjoy other rights not described. So third plus fourth plus fifth plus ninth, and the fourteenth, and Justice Douglas got a right to marital privacy, which extended to the state of Connecticut in Griswold v. Connecticut. This was a case involving the use of contraception, but it had nothing to do with quartering. And indeed, in the dissent in Griswold v. Connecticut, a frustrated Justice Potter Stewart wrote, no soldier has been quartered in any home! Exclamation point. And there you have it. That's almost all you need to know about constitutional interpretation in those two ideas. Does the Constitution set values that need to be applied to the times? Do they give us rights beyond what the words say? 
Or do they just give us protection from a specific set of grievances that are clearly listed? Those are the two questions. Indeed, it's kind of like the Felix Unger and Oscar Madison between these two ideas, where you have William O. Douglas and the clothes are all over the room, and Potter Stewart as Felix Unger is coming in and saying, clean this up and let's have a nice, concise statement. Well, focusing today on the littlest, least important, least used part of the Bill of Rights might be important, not because it's being violated anytime soon, because it might provide some insight. Why? Well, it's very specific. It describes only one situation, the quartering of a soldier in any home and time of peace. It even allows that in war, as long as it's prescribed by law, and not some burly sergeant knocking at your door and asking for a room and, and where is the fridge, that it can actually be done. The others, the first, the second, the tenth, the eighth, all have terms which are fought over. Militia, establishment, cruel and unusual, keep and bear, that we off debate. It's hard to do that with the third. Soldier is very easy to define. Home is easy. And once you get over the fact that quartering involves more than just space in your house, that Private Parker will not just be staying with you, but you'll have to give him hogs, honey spiced wine, and maybe a hot shower. Quarter's a pretty easy term to define, too. I suggest by the inclusion of the little third that the intention of the amendments is specific and suggest that they operated on the theory in the creation of the Bill of Rights. And when we say creation, we're talking about House committees, we're talking about state ratifying conventions, voting, not just a, a group of men in a room. They operated with an understanding that if you wanted something, you needed to say it. If you wanted something banned, you needed to ban it. Notice they did not say anything in the third about civilian control of the military, any general comment, and they did not ban standing armies. Oh, but you might argue, they come from a different age and, you know, they spoke in archaic terms and they wouldn't have said that. That can't be true. The Massachusetts 1780 Convention makes clear, standing armies are dangerous to liberty and military power shall be held in exact subordination to it. No such statement in the U.S. Constitution, which came after that. Virginia's Declaration of Rights said that standing armies in time of peace should be avoided. Not so in the Constitution. The Constitution roughly limits standing armies, but does allow for them, because it allows Congress to raise and support armies, in addition to controlling the militia when needed, but limits the appropriation for armies for two years. A slight limit to standing armies, but not a direct one, because Congress can vote again in two years and keep the army going. So civilian power in the U.S. Constitution is assured by giving the powers of commander-in-chief to the president, a civilian elected officer, by giving the ability to declare war to the people's body, the Congress, and to have a standing army every two years, and or summoning the militia. But it also provides for an army. There's no general statement in the U.S. Constitution like standing armies are bad or military power is subordinate to civilian. I think you can use the third as a symbol, as a window into the American culture, culture of strong individual rights, where often Americans make individual rights supreme. During the debate over the Third Amendment, for instance, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, who had been present at the Constitutional Convention, now a senator from Connecticut, argued that the Third Amendment was not needed. After all, marching troops deserved a home. And why should a single individual, a private homeowner, be able to stand in the way of the public good? It's a convincing argument, perhaps, but not one that convinced the new Congress. America is not a military society, but a civilian one. The third protects American citizens from quartering soldiers, unless American citizens want to. And there's all sorts of examples, particularly during deployments or when a base is being repaired, where American citizens volunteer to quarter civilians. That's fine. But it protects the American citizens from that being forced on them by the government. It prevents one abusive action a government might take, pretty extreme action, and it made the cut as an amendment where others didn't. Because of the reluctance to do any Bill of Rights. you got to remember, you had anti-federalists who didn't even want the whole Constitution, and the compromise was, for some of them, was adding a Bill of Rights. The Federalist majority in Congress, many of them didn't want to do it because they didn't believe in such things, that this 
It was ridiculed as parchment rights, always violated by whoever had the power. The key thing was to institute proper mechanisms of power, not to give rights written down on a piece of paper, which could easily be violated. Checks and balances were more important. But the Bill of Rights was good enough to have some movement in the Rhode Island legislature and the North Carolina legislature and these states, which had been reluctant to join the Constitution, then did after the passage of these amendments. But overall, the project was one of a limited nature. Framers of the Bill of Rights weren't silly enough to insist on benevolence on the part of government or to give positive rights, like people have the right to expect a job, people have the right to food, have the right for transportation. You know, none of this was provided. It was just simply the extremes of what government should not do. Don't infringe speech. Don't infringe the right to keep and bear. Don't inflict cruel and unusual punishments. Don't quarter soldiers. Can it be interpreted more generally? Does the third suggest home as castle? Sure it does, especially along with the fourth, it suggests an idea of that. But it protects that idea of home as castle in a pretty extreme situation. Releases that protection even if there's a condition of war and Congress takes a vote. Yet none of this really ends the conversation, nor do I mean to dip too much into absolute originalism. There's still a rich conversation to be had in law schools and in political blogs interpreting the prohibitions as stated. It can still be a lot of fun. What does the purpose statement of the Second Amendment mean? How cruel is cruel? What actions constitute establishing a religion? Does a screaming baby have speech rights? Does a wacky funeral protester with a fluorescent colored sign have speech rights equal to a newspaper? These are all questions that can be oft debated, and this is why I think the Constitution continues to live on. But in reading the third and in thinking about why a third was even included and why it made a cut where others didn't, just kind of shine a light on what might be the place of... Uh, creative rights handled through the courts without an amendment process. Of course, this this becomes an important debate because we could be here knocking down the right to privacy, which is cherished. We could be talking about Griswold. We could be talking about Roe, right? Well, I think a couple of things there that's not so obvious. The right to privacy, really marital privacy, which was asserted in Griswold, could be considered to be quite traditional and might have been justified on the basis of the ninth alone. But of course, in a decision, you're going to use as many arguments as you can. And there's a stare decisis or, you know, leave the law as be. There is another read on the third that I should mention. Georgetown Law Journal article advocated this, and it's quite interesting, that it separates broadly civilian and military life in America, that it prevents at a constitutional level things like NSA wiretapping, and college campus recruiting by colleges that don't want recruiters there. Now, why is that? Well, this read on the Third Amendment is that quartering is a more broad term than just having soldiers in one's home. And going back to that quote we gave about Sam Adams talking in the time of the Revolution, that there are troops in the body of our city. He wasn't talking about troops in his house. He's talking about troops in Boston at all. And there's some truth to that. What really bothered American colonists was the presence of troops among them. Not so much always in their house. And so that part, I think, is right. I think anyone making a law should consider these traditional values. But in terms of the constitutional protection, I would argue that it's a more of a specific protection. Okay, so many people are putting this case in Henderson, Nevada on my radar. It occurred after my Third Amendment podcast. Henderson police arrested a family for refusing to let officers use their home as lookout for a domestic violence investigation of their neighbors. On the morning of July 10th, 2011, officers from the Henderson, Nevada Police Department responded to a domestic violence call at a neighbor's residence. An officer contacted Anthony Mitchell contacted him via his telephone. The officer told Mitchell, the police need to occupy your home in order to gain a tactical advantage against the occupant of the neighboring house. Anthony Mitchell told the officer that he did not want to become involved and he didn't want the police to enter his residence. Well, a few minutes before noon, at least five officers arrayed themselves in front of Anthony Mitchell's house. They banked forcefully on the door and loudly commanded Anthony Mitchell to open the door to his residence. What does Anthony Mitchell do? He calls his mother. 
Linda Mitchell, telling her that the police are beating on his door. No, there's no answer to the door, so officers use a metal ram and bust open the door. As Anthony Mitchell stands in shock, the telephone in his hand, the officers aim their weapons at him, shout obscenities, according to the report of the Mitchells, and order him to lie down on the floor. Fearing for his life, Mitchell drops the phone, covers his face. They told him to shut off the phone. And they told him to crawl towards the officers. Confused and terrified, Anthony Mitchell remained on the floor, curled up, hands over his face, made no movement. Officers fire multiple pepper ball rounds at him. As he lay defensive on the floor, Mitchell was struck at least three times by shots fired from close range, injuring him, causing severe pain. Officers then arrest him for obstructing a police officer, search the house, move furniture, etc., and set up the place to use as a lookout of the neighboring home. Fortunately, that's not all to the story. Mitchell's pet, a female dog named Sam, a terrified animal, according to the Mitchells, posed no threat, but they shot it in the face with a pepper ball round. The animal panicked, howled in fear, and fled from the residence. This is Nevada. It is over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The dog was left trapped outside for much of the day. The officers also move to Linda Mitchell's residence. They're in separate houses. They take Michael Mitchell to the police station. When he tries to leave, he's handcuffed. When Michael Mitchell starts to realize this is just an attempt to get him out of his house so they can use his house, which he doesn't want them to do, he tries to leave the police station. He's arrested, handcuffed, and placed in the back of a marked police car. Both Anthony and Michael Mitchell are then thrown into the jail. Anthony and Michael Mitchell are booked for obstructing an officer. Eventually, all the criminal claims are dismissed. The case doesn't end because the Mitchells now file a suit against the Henderson, Nevada Police Department because, among other things, their Third Amendment rights are violated. I think it's just one of these merit-lacking third cases that do come up from time to time that people thinking that any time troops or police enter their house that it's quartering. Quartering had a very, very specific definition. No troops shall be quartered in any home. Very simple. It is not a metaphor for all military, for all police happening to use your home as a venue. In this story, although I do feel sympathy, I also feel sympathy perhaps for any victim that might have been in the neighboring house. And perhaps uh, the police needed to get a better position in order to save somebody's life. So, uh, you know, there's a difference between using your house for a search, where items going to, going to be in that search are going to be used against you in a persecution, and a tactical use of a home during a live and occurring situation. The police are bound to have a first priority of saving lives or saving someone from injury. So that's what I think about it. I, I really think quartering is very clear in the meaning of it when it was enacted. It's really providing, being forced to provide by the government, bed, rest, and food for extended period of time for soldiers. So I think it's a real stretch. Now, I know that you know constitutional rights can expand, but I think it's a real stretch to turn the third into just a simple metaphor for any time troops enter a house. I hope that you've enjoyed this look at one of the most obscure parts of the Constitution and certainly one of the more obscure parts of the Bill of Rights. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. I want to thank you for listening, and if you do like the program, please tell someone about it.